ladies and gentlemen. Some time ago, when I was working as chief secretary of the government of Andhra Pradesh, my elder brother called me home. He is 15 years older than I am. And uh, after I finished the visit, he came to the door to see me off. And then he said, come again when you don't have so much time to spare. So I don't wish to overstay my welcome yet. Already I think we made a late beginning. Let's see if I can just touch up on a few issues of general importance to agriculture in general, agriculture in India, and to the scientific community in particular, and see whether we can get this conference going on the right note from our point of view, at least. And uh, I'm happy indeed to be here in this very distinguished gathering. People from right around the globe and those connected intimately with the disciplines of horticulture and agricultural sciences. I myself am only an official order of agriculture. I am not the scientist by profession and certainly not in agriculture. And uh, as my father used to say <clears throat> when I was much younger, when I started learning to play the guitar, he told me once he said you play the guitar with much more enthusiasm than expertise. I think that is more or less what describes my association with agriculture. But I am consoled by one or two examples I remember from history. Mark Twain, the very famous uh, humorist, once said that I have a vague memory of going to school, but I remember it did not interfere with my education. And John Bentham, the famous <coughs> political philosopher also, wrote his autobiography. And in that, chapter 3 says, end of school. And chapter 4 says, beginning of education. So, I have been a sort of observer of agriculture only for a long, long time. Not a student or a, a teacher. But then, I think, I have gathered enough experience to be able to stand up in a forum like this and uh, at least make an impassioned plea for a few things that I believe should be happening in this sector, especially in our country. We all know that ever since the Times Immemorial when the sh emphasis shifted from capture of food to culture of animals and uh, plants, agriculture has always remained a very integral part of uh, growth and development in all societies. A strong agriculture se sector is necessary for food and nutrition security and also for employment and the welfare and well-being of a very large proportion of population all over the world. Uh, can I have this taken off, please? A substantial portion of the population, much more than 50% depends on agriculture for a livelihood. We cannot achieve the goal of inclusive growth in its true sense without providing livelihood security to the farming community. The challenge facing agriculture and farming in the 21st century is to feed a growing population and using sustainable farming methods worldwide, close to a billion people, almost one in seven of the population of the world, go to bed hungry every day. The FAO, uh, can I have the first slide, please? Way back in 1996, in the World Food Summit, a decision was taken by the international community that, uh, that the number of undernourished people in the world would be halved by 2010. At that time, the figure mentioned was about 800 million people, and they wanted it to come down to 400 million people. And this was part of the Millennium Development Goals, which the FAO had set itself, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, much later, eight goals, and the first one, rightly so, to, if you ask me, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. The next one, please. Yeah. And, and still promote sustainability is, I think, something we all should be looking for. The chief task ahead of us is well known. You'll no doubt recall that Oscar Wilde set up George Bernard Shaw. Uh, that, uh, Mr. Shaw has no enemies, but is intensely disliked by his friends. Now, agriculture in India and the farming community in particular, I find, are in a somewhat similar position. Everybody talks platitudes about what should be done for agriculture and what should be done for the farmer. But when it comes to the crunch of actually setting apart some funds and devising a doable strategy, things don't happen. 
So it's I have been saying for quite a few years now that our country has become obsessed with numbers in terms of production and productivity, which is not enough. It's good, it's necessary, yes, we have we need to increase production, we need to increase yields. There are big gaps and then and there is a need in this country for more and more food and other commodities. But then the most important thing is the farmer's income at the farm level. If agriculture does not remain viable, if it does not uh, attract the farming community, and if the building block, the individual farm, of the whole production system of the country collapses, then where will be, especially in a country like ours? And this, I think, shift is yet to be seen, in, especially in places such as the Ministry of Agriculture and the government in India. So we need to invest more and more in agriculture research in particular because new and complex issues are coming up. The environment outside us is getting more and more complicated. What with the advent of liberalization, privatization, international obligations in commerce and things like that. But And it's also generally accepted, all of us know, that growth in the future will have to come largely from horticultural sciences and fisheries because I think the other areas are more or less back over. But in this case, I wish to make just one point. In 1994, I was in Israel. For the first time, I think an Indian team went there after 1948. Mr. Sharad Pawar was then the chief minister of Maharashtra. I was part of his team. And then we found that the Agricultural Research Organization of Israel, its budget, 97.5% of its total budget was contract from uh, you know, research data. 2.5% is really being done in a you know, sort of demand-driven, contracted form so far, which is uh, something which uh, puzzles me. And I think a community such as yours should address this issue the world over and see whether we should transit from the currently largely supply mode research to a demand-driven kind of system, and which addresses you know, uh, the farm problems voiced by the farming community. And I also believe that in addressing these issues in the future, five mantras are very, very important. The, I mean, mantra is a Sanskrit word which, as you know, means man is to think and tra is a tool. So it's really an instrument of thought. And these five should be really one, the five major players that support agriculture are the agricultural research system, the extension services, credit, <coughs> insurance cover, and market access. So I think unless we address these five support services and remodel them, and then kickstart them into a new era of uh, thinking and support, things will not begin to happen. And also, there are hitherto unknown phenomena we are dealing with, like for instance, climate change. And most of us have for too long tended to look at the challenge of climate change, food security and poverty separately. I think this is a mistake because of certain reasons. 75% of the world's poor live in rural areas and they depend on agriculture. And the production will need to increase by 70% in the next 40 years if 9 billion people by then have to be fed. And climate models predict a much more uncertain climate which will have a particularly <coughs> deleterious effect on agriculture. And agriculture, forestry, and land use account for nearly 30% of greenhouse emissions in the world. And we cannot succeed in the battle against climate change without including these elements. And sustained increases in agricultural production, yields, and prices, and the keys to food and nutrition security are much more important to developing countries. And to those in those countries who live on the edge of the poverty line. So agriculture scientists, I think, will need to concentrate on the elusive triple bill research program. Firstly, I think we have to increase farm productivity and incomes. Secondly, we have to make agriculture more resilient to variations in climate and promote stability and security. Thirdly, we have to help agriculture sector part of the solution and not, not be seen merely as a problem. Now, we all know that another major issue we have to contend with in the future is natural resource degradation. Uh, it's a serious economic, social and environmental issue. 
land loss, soil erosion, water scarcity, and forest loss determine the natural resource base that drives economic development and social stability in developing countries. To cope with these problems, a variety of responses will be needed. Uh, more investment will, of course, be required, as I said, including biotechnology on crops and cropping methods, resilient to floods, high temperatures, and droughts, and improved water management practices will become uh, areas of paramount concern. It is crucial to combine new attention to the impact of climate change with <coughs> pro poor approaches to rural development and more sustainable models for agriculture, such as organic farming, water and soil and water conservation programs. In, in India in particular, new measures like, for instance, contract farming, I found you know, in many areas, like uh, oil farm, or in olden days we used to have tobacco and uh, sugar, where on the one hand, the farmer is ensured a buyer and a price, and the processor is ensured raw material of good quality at reasonable price and continuous supply. And there is a, also the economy of scale to the poor farmer because in technology and infrastructure become available without each farmer having to invest in it. I mean, I'm just mentioning it as an example of the direction in which future strategies could possibly lie because fragmentation of holdings and lack of access to infrastructure are becoming major issues, especially in our country. And uh, we need in the future, I think, a research of progress and action, not merely intellectual research or blue sky research, but research which is, you know, a sort of whose agenda is set by, as I said, the demand of the farming community. I have no objection at all to people doing research into Shakespeare or Beethoven and things like that. But I, I humbly submit that should not be at public expense. They can do whatever they want. But I think all public research should relate to public issues in the future as much as possible. Uh, especially when we find this divide between the farming community's needs and what is really being achieved in the intellectual field. And the, we'll all recollect the message of the Green Revolution which is very simple. Apply better seeds, increase fertilizer application, provide irrigation facilities, yields will increase. That happened. And now, the next leap forward is yet ever, although we all agree that agriculture is in a state of crisis. Dr. F.S. Swaminathan keeps talking of uh, a second green revolution or an evergreen uh, revolution, but uh, that if we are to meet that challenge, there is no secret formula, there is no magic wand, but uh, we really have to uh, address all the issues which I mentioned in a sort of integrated manner. Maybe thousands of approaches will be required and each one tailored to local requirements. And the ideas <coughs> may not be new, but the whole idea of credit, insurance, research, extension, and meteorology, delivering what the farmer wants at a given place for a given crop at a given time, rather than the cafeteria approach of saying, look, I have all these things, what do you want? I think that's it was a major mind shift which we are, uh, Dr. Devi Prasad and I are experimenting with a small program in the Center for Good Governance here in Hyderabad, hoping to establish the fact that this can be done on a very, very large scale by piloting it in a few villages and seeing whether these actors can be persuaded in the future to tailor their products to what the farmer requires. Because otherwise, Agriculture will never transit from this being a sustenance occupation to a commercial activity. And the farmer will continue to churn out commodities but fail to deliver products. Because we all know that if you go to Paris, for instance, a mango is not a mango unless it has a particular color, a particular size, a particular shape. And in fact, surprisingly, the one thing which is not demanded is taste. But, uh, it, it, but we we believe that what we produce has to be marketed. I think with good agricultural practices and traceability coming into the environment, we now have to begin with the market and see whether we can produce what the market wants. So we have to hold our ability to remain alive to the imperatives of the environment, carry on a dialogue with the environment, spot threats and opportunities, and then organize robust responses by the farming community. 
this is not an easy job, but it's not as difficult as it sounds either. But in the process, I wish to also quickly conclude by saying that there's a French proverb which says, plus a chance, plus a main shows. The more you change things, the more they tend to remain the same. So, like for instance, in our country, uh, since 1950, 50 plus 14, 64 years, what have we not done? We have done everything in a, you know, every field, education, like health, roads, poverty, agriculture, uh, all sorts of things have, you know, been tried, but by and large, the fact remains that it's a fact scaling it as in our face, India is ranked 136th in the Committee of Nations in the Human Development Indices. I don't think this is something to be proud of. And if agriculture is as important as we believe it is to the development of these indices, which we know it is, then it's time we address this a little purposefully. And I hope you people will not go away from this event uh, without looking at the big picture. And I mean, the role of agriculture and the role of agriculture in human development in this is improvement, especially in food and nutrition security, and how these five major actors have to change their attitude, especially the research community, the research scientific community, so that my hope is that this event will not uh, remain a standalone event, that if like Neil Armstrong, the astronaut who stepped on the moon, he said, it's a small step for me, but a major leap for mankind. I hope this conference will also represent a sort of watershed in the development of the uh, <coughs> a new strategy for addressing the problems of agriculture and the farmer in the future. And I myself, as a student of mathematics, am a great admirer of Einstein. And Einstein had this very uncanny knack. For centuries, scientific research always was a sequential operation. Experiment, observation, inference was the you know way in which research went. But then Einstein used to just sit, contemplate, and then imagine that something is bound to be there, and then devise a method of reaching that uh, thing which is uh, had mentally conceived. I think this is possible. We all need to have a vision, a big picture in our mind, and then decide how we should go about it <coughs> because. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said uh, that we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours. So I think whatever output the scientific community could, you know, comes with, I think it should immediately find its relevance and application in the farmer's field. That is when research will have served its purpose. And I am very often reminded of a Sanskrit sloka. It says, Omkar Parivuttam Vishwam and Sankalpa Parivuttam Dusyam. It means that the universe is bound by the Omkara. Omkara is really sound, sound is electricity, electricity is magnetism, magnetism is whatever. So all energy is the same. And research in CERN in Switzerland has shown us recently, God's particle, that at the end of the age of the space time of the universe, there are ripples in energy, which is really what the shloka says. But the second part says, Sankalpa Parivita Prusyam, that what you visualize, the bigness of what you see depends on your intentions. If you want to look at the big picture, you look at the big picture. Otherwise, your vision will be narrowed to what is around you and you will never get out of that syndrome. And Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the next slide, I wish to conclude with this. Doubt or when it's their self becomes too much with you. Apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and weakest man or woman whom you have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him or her. Will he or she, these he, she's, etc., I think they are gender sensitive interpolations because Gandhiji used only one word those days. And uh, uh, control over his life, own life and destiny. In other words, will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melt away. You see, I think if we remember this message that ultimately our efforts should have a direction and the direction should be towards the hungry of the world and must have some immediate meaning for them, I think everything will become quite simple.
Only thing is, the I don't. Uh, are the friends of the media here? Yeah, media here. Okay, good. No, because I wanted just with this. I stop with this and uh, wanted earnestly appeal to them to carry the message of this conference to those people outside, to all the stakeholders, because. Uh, Without wanting to offend the media, I just want to tell them a small story. Uh, there was a, the Italian bishop who was going to the U.S. and he was on a, going on a visit to America and he went to the Pope for an audience and sought advice. <coughs> what should I do in the United States? And the Pope said, please be very careful with the press in particular because they are very intrusive, aggressive and they don't respect your privacy. Sometimes they may sensationalize what you are saying. So he decided to be extremely cautious and when he got on at LaGuardia Airport, a cub reporter went to him, I believe and said, Bishop, will you be visiting any nightclubs? Now this man was very, very embarrassed by this question, that was coming from a youngster. So he said, uh, he didn't know what to say, so he wanted to act innocent. So he said, uh, uh, are there any nightclubs in New York? And the next morning, all papers carried headlines and the first question the Italian Bishop asked on arrival is the number of nightclubs in New York. So he was upset. And then next afternoon he was addressing a small gathering and I believe he said, are the gentlemen of the press here? Some hands went up. He said, please remember that I'm only in Houston and I've, I've traveled all the way to San Francisco across the country for three months. And if you write all that I say, my stories will become stale. So please don't report what I'm saying. So next day's headlines were, Italian bishop tells many stories all unprintable. So, there is no way in which you can reach the gentlemen of the press unless they decide voluntarily to cooperate with us. I know this is not cricket, this is not films, this is not violence, this is not sex, but it is an important area. So, if you can please in the future remember that it's a part of your professional responsibility or to suppose causes like this, it will do us all a great deal of help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohan.